So next we're gonna talk about acute respiratory distress syndrome, syndrome, also known as ARDS. So ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome, it is a progressive respiratory failure. When we say respiratory failure, think of it any organ that fails. Effectively, it's not doing its job. And so how, do you, how does your respiratory system fail? Well, it stops being able to oxygenate or ventilate. That's what respiratory failure is. Um, and so uh, causes of ARDS or common causes if patients have lung injury, pneumonia, um, aspiration, uh, pancreatitis is closely related to this and also sepsis. Um, ARDS is an issue with oxygenation. So, you know, like sometimes, you know, people can have respiratory failure when they have COPD and they can be um, in like a ventilatory um, respiratory failure, but this, this is an oxygen problem. And what the oxygen problem is, what makes ARDS different is that no matter how much oxygen you give a patient, their oxygen levels in their blood and in their tissues, like their SpO2 will not increase. And that's what we call refractory hypoxemia. So what's going on inside? Why can this patient not get the oxygen they need? There's injury to the, in the alveoli where there's that capillary membrane. Um, and so that, that's where oxygen exchange happens. So what happens is there's some sort of injury that leads to inflammation, that inflammation. Um, and if you remember kind of about, think of like sepsis, how, um, you know, we talked about the fact that when there's inflammation, that um, your um, capillaries and blood vessels, they open up to try to create a place, uh, you know, a way for, um, you know, all of the um, infection and infl inflammation fighting um, particles to come help. Like, so pretty much they're trying to open the doors to let all the defenses in because they're like, hey, there's inflammation. Something's not good here. I need to send all my guys in to fix this. Um, so what happens is that because that inflammation starts happening, your capillaries become what we call more permeable or the doors open to your capillaries. And then what uh, that allows for is that fluid shifts happen and a bunch of debris and particles and stuff builds up. So eventually this leads the alveoli to collapse um, and then you don't have gas exchange like you need to. But just kind of look at this picture. On the left here is how your, you know, your lung should be. You know, there's occasional particles and stuff like that. But oxygen exchange can still happen. Oxygen can get in, CO2 can get out. But what happens in ARDS is that this um, alveoli fills with a bunch of junk. Um, there's, it's full of fluid. It's full of particles. There's no way oxygen can get in. Um, and there's no way that CO2 can get out too. But the bigger problem is we can't get oxygen in. And this is why, like, you know, no matter how much oxygen we give, if I have a alveoli that are just filled with fluid, um, oxygen can't push through all that fluid, all that debris. Um, and so no matter how much I give them, it's not enough um, in order to, um, I would call it, get them the oxygen that they need, especially because usually they're dealing with other processes that require more oxygenation. So what do patients with ARDS look like? Um, their early symptoms are going to be of a rapid respiratory rate or tachypnea. They can have a cough. Um, and sometimes they have no symptoms. Um, the late symptoms are going to be respiratory distress or dyspnea. Um, they can also have increased work of breathing, or they could be using accessory muscles. And we differentiate ARDS because the big thing that makes it different, because I know these are more general symptoms, is that, you know, the thing that we start to notice is that we're given a more and more oxygen and their levels are not getting any better. Like nothing is working. Like normally, like if a patient's not breathing well, they're breathing fast, they're in distress, we put them on some oxygen put a mask on them, something, it helps. In these patients, it does not get better. And that's what kind of stands out for us for this patient. So we diagnose ARDS off the ABG. We check what's called a PF ratio. And a PF ratio um, is the ratio, or we, um, we do like a, um, a division of how what their PAO2 is. And if you remember PAO2, that's the number on the ABG that says how much oxygen is in their arteries or how much supply do I have available? And then we're gonna divide that by how much oxygen they're on. So a normal PF ratio is greater than 400. So like right now, let's say that they checked my blood and in my blood, my PaO2 is 100. You know, um, normal um, is 80 to 100. Um, let's say mine was 100. And then I'm on 21% because that's what I'm breathing in the air. My PF ratio would be 476. But you can kind of see how this works is that if I have a patient that has ARDS, they're not getting oxygen. So their PaO2 is going to be low 
and then the amount of oxygen that they need is going to be high because I'm trying to give them a lot of oxygen, but their oxygen levels are still getting low. Um, you know, so that's why, you know, like it says here, when oxygen levels go down, so when the PaO2 goes down, and then your requirements or how much oxygen you need in your body, because you have that low supply, so you need more oxygen, when that goes up, these numbers are going to decrease. So, um, you know, the way that we kind of, um, you know, look at ARDS is we consider, you know, severe if their PF ratio is less than 100, um, you know, and then the mild is when it, uh, the mild is when it's like one, uh, 200 to 300, and then once it's getting down to 100 to 200, it's moderate. Um, but yeah, I've seen patients with some pretty low um, PF ratios, and it um, this has a very high morbidity and mortality if it's not caught early um, or treated early. And we're going to talk about those treatments here in a minute. So for ARDS, um, one of the other things that we notice is they have what's called a whited out chest X-ray. So in a normal chest X-ray, which I have a picture on the next slide that kind of shows normal versus abnormal. In a normal X-ray, um, there's a lot of black space here in the, um, in the lungs because that's going to be space where um, obviously oxygenation can happen. Usually the black is showing that, you know, there's air and gas exchange happening. All this white means there's a bunch of junk. There's stuff, fluid, debris and stuff built up. So there's not a lot of oxygen exchange happening here. Um, and you can see like, you can barely see any oxygenation happening anywhere in both these lung pictures. To kind of show a side by side. So this left one is ARDS and this is what a normal one is supposed to look like. And look how hazy, you can barely see through it. It's very, what we call whited out. Um, so just kind of look side by side to show you what that looks like. This is some severe ARDS. So how do we treat these patients? So we give them oxygen administration because that's really what they're missing. But remember, that, you know, that only helps so much. So what we need to give them is PEEP. This is a problem in their alveoli. And if you remember from my ventilator video, what PEEP is, is PEEP is um, a setting on the ventilator. It's something you and I have intrinsically. We have a little bit of it. Um, but, you know, on the ventilator, we can increase this. And it's a way that, excuse me, we can manipulate oxygenation. Effectively what it does, PEEP, if you increase your PEEP on a ventilator, it increases the amount of um, uh, expansion of your alveoli. So in other words, you know, normally when you're breathing, your lung opens, close, opens, close, like, and this is your alveoli too, you know, they're, um, you know, um, opening, taking breath in and exhaling. So going this, what PEEP does is it keeps them open all the time. So it's open, open, open. So they're never collapsing. And so that really helps. Remember how we talked about when this happens that the alveoli shrink and collapse. This keeps them open all the time, which anytime the alveoli are open, it allows for more gas exchange. So that means I can get more oxygen in um, and I have a better, ch it also helps um, kind of create some pressure to really push that oxygen in. Um, but as a whole, we um, one of the most important treatments is going to be giving them extra PEEP um, to really help. Um, it's what we call recruiting or opening the alveoli so that they can um, breathe more effectively. We also want to do um, protective lung strategies. We cannot cure ARDS once the process is started. It's going to be in motion and, you know, there's multiple different phases of it. So what we want to do is we want to protect the lung. So kind of think of like heart failure, um, how, you know, once you're there, you know, you can't reverse it. All you can do is try to make it where it's not going to get worse and try to decrease some of the damage or that, you know, all those things that is the heart's trying to do to fight itself, um, you know, to try to make things better that only make things worse. So that's why we want to, we use different ventilator modes and I don't think you need to know that in depth of what those modes are, but we use special modes that are gonna help where we're not going to do too much damage to the lungs. Our goal is pretty much, you know, if you remember back to my ventilator video, that ventilator, um, being on a ventilator can cause a lot of damage. There's a lot of pressure, a lot of possible complications. Um, so what we wanna do with these patients is that we want to put them on a mode that's not gonna give them too too much pressure and like cause damp more inflammation or problems in their lungs, but still going to give them the oxygenation, everything that they need. Um, so we, that's what we call protective lung strategies. Um, we're also going to position them and we're going to put them in a prone position. And I'm going to talk about why here in a minute, but um, that positioning, especially doing that early, really helps to decrease morbidity and mortality for this. Um, additionally, we do, um, we focus on nutrition therapy, and then we support their hemodynamics. We give them inotropes and vasopressors as needed. A lot of times because of that excess fluid they're going to have from that inflammatory process, they're going to need diuretics, um, IV fluids as needed. You can see it kind of just depends on the patient, you know, <laughs> some of them might need diuretics, some might need IV fluids. Um, we want to keep them um, comfortable. And a lot of times they're, uh, we're going to have to give them a medical paralytic um, to help because their lungs are so stiff after the 
inflammatory process happens with ARDS, they go into a fibrotic stage um, where their lungs get incredibly stiff and there's nothing like they just, they're non-compliant, which means like, you know, it's kind of like um, uh, if your lungs were like a brick wall, imagine a brick wall trying to expand to let oxygen in. They just do not want to expand. So it's going to make oxygenation that much harder. So sometimes what we have to do is we have to relax those muscles, um, kind of, you know, give them a little bit of a break. And so we put them on a, um, uh, a uh, what we call a medical paralytic medication like Nimbex that I talked about in my um, sedation and analgesics PowerPoint. Um, but effectively that's going to help to allow their muscles to relax so the ventilator can do its job. So like I mentioned, positioning is key. And so um, this, this bed on the right is what we call a rotoprone bed. And if you can't tell, they're facing down. So this bed, um, the patient is going to be laying face down in this bed. Um, and we usually keep them in it. I mean, sometimes they can be in it for days to weeks, but we usually keep them in it at least for two to four days, um, you know, to um, help with, um, allow their lungs to expand better. And I show a little bit on the next slide why that really helps. Um, these beds are really exper expensive. So, you know, one thing that we started doing at my hospital. And it also takes like, obviously there's like a lot of mechanical parts to it. Um, uh, there's a lot more to it, but it takes a while to get the bed. It's very expensive um, for that patient too. And so um, one thing that we started to do is we started a manual proning um, protocol, which is where instead of um, putting them um, prone on a special bed, we put them prone on their own bed and protect their skin as much as we can. Um, and we do this a lot now with COVID and stuff like that. This has become like a mainstay treatment for COVID positive patients that are really sick. Um, this really helps to uh, allow them to have better oxygenation. So why does this help? How does putting them on their belly help? It seems like it would be counterintuitive, like they can't expand. But if you don't know this, you actually expand your lungs from behind. So if I'm laying like against a hard surface or a bed, and um, what do you call it? Like if I'm laying on my back, um, it actually decreases my lung expansion. So think of like the tripod position, how like sitting upright, it allows your lungs to expand back. It allows for your alveoli to have a better chance of opening and not collapsing. It also puts less pressure on the lungs from the heart diaphragm, uh, and then, oh, sorry, from the heart and then the diaphragm can relax. Um, and so as a whole, it actually helps open up a lot more opportunities by putting them face down. So we keep them in that position. Um, like I said, sometimes for days, I've had patients on in that position for weeks sometimes. Um, but um, usually we, um, you know, because of skin and other issues, we try, you know, we'll do it for a few days and we'll try to flip them over and see if they can tolerate being on their back and see how their oxygenation is. Because a lot of times they're doing really well and then we flip them over and then all of a sudden their lungs are like, nope, not liking this position at all. So what can I do as a nurse? We need to do a thorough respiratory assessment and note any changes. What are their lung sounds? What's the respiratory effort? Um, I'm gonna monitor their um, labs, uh, their ABG, their oxygen level. It's gonna be really key to monitor, especially since that is what the problem is in ARDS. I'm gonna be uh, monitoring and managing their hemodynamic status. So this patient's gonna be on a lot of PEEP. And if you remember um, what I mentioned about with PEEP in my ventilator PowerPoint is that when there's excess PEEP, there's also excess pressure in my um, chest and it puts pressure on the blood a vessel that's returning blood to my heart. So it actually decreases my blood that's flowing back to my heart, which therefore decreases my cardiac output. Um, so I need to monitor their hemodynamics because as I turn that peep up, their blood pressure is going to go down. I'm also going to support, um, so it's like the peep is helping, but then it doesn't help the you know, blood pressure. So yeah, peep helps the ARDS, doesn't help the blood pressure. Um, I'm going to support their respiratory system, um, make sure they're properly positioned, whether it's prone or otherwise, like if they're not prone, making sure to turn them regularly um, and um, support the respiratory therapist and whatever um, treatments and things that they're doing. Um, keep the client comfortable. So make sure they're on medications that are going to help with this process and help them to breathe comfortably. Um, mobilize secretion. So we do a lot of um, respiratory therapies like the chest percussion therapy and stuff like that to try to get all that junk out. Um, you know, making sure I'm suctioning them regularly and trying to um, get all of that, um, that excess, that in, those inflammatory mediators, the excess fluid that's all built up in my lungs. I wanna try to get that stuff up. Um, and then, um, 
uh, you know, I want to prevent complications. So this patient's going to be immobile. And a lot of times, um, like ARDS is a battle that sometimes takes weeks if they can recover from it. Um, so um, DVT prophylaxis, like, so they're usually going to be on heparin or Lovenox. Um, and so um, heparin or enoxaparin, I should say. I try to use the generic names for y'all. Um, and so the other big thing is one of the biggest risks of putting a patient in a prone position is that it's really bad for the skin. Because if you lay in any position for two long, um, you know, um, everything kind of like starts seeping in that direction. So this patient, like before we can even put them prone, we, they, um, family has to sign a consent. And this is probably not something you're going to be tested over this part of things, but like, this is a JPS policy, but um, family has to sign a consent that they know the patient's going to get skin breakdown and that like, you know, it's not, they're not going to sue or anything like that for that skin breakdown, because there's no way keeping them in that position with all those tubes that they have, their breathing tube, their feeding tube and everything that they're going to not get skin breakdown. We pad all of their bony prominences. Um, we watch their skin regularly, but it's literally they're um, like, they're going to be facing flat. Sometimes as I said for days, sometimes for weeks. And so um, we turn them every few hours, but even though we do that, um, it's, there's still all these patients end up with some sort of skin breakdown. Um, so yeah, so we do everything we can to prevent that. So I'm going to watch their skin closely, uh, make sure that I keep them as clean as possible. But a lot of these patients, what they need is rest. And so as much as it's not great to get a skin breakdown, um, you know, when it comes to the ABCs, you know, we always focus on that airway and breathing first. And so we're doing our best to protect while also uh, making sure that, you know, we have them in a position that's going to support their ability to breathe at all. So, yeah. So those are just some things to get you started kind of thinking about ARDS. I hope this kind of, um, you know, puts some things in perspective and helps you to understand things a little bit better, um, for how you can help this patient and, um, you know, get them doing better. So I'll see you next time.